everybody, and welcome to this on-demand event powered by Demand Drive. My name is AJ Alonzo. I will be the host of today's event, and I've got a fantastic guest with me, Nishit Asnani. He's one of the co-founders over at Sybil. Nishit, how are you? I am doing fantastic. Thanks a lot for having me here, AJ. Yeah, of course. Second time that you've been uh, featured in some type of content that we have. Um, what you're building must work because we love it. No, I'm kidding. Um, we're big fans of what you guys are doing over at Sybil. It's going to be the focus of the conversation today in terms of conversational intelligence, leveraging AI, really getting the most out of your sales team. But before we jump into the nitty gritty, just wanted to get some housekeeping out of the way real quick. Um, like I mentioned, this is a pre-recorded event. You might be watching this the day that it drops. You might be watching this two months from now. You might be watching this 10 years into the future. If you are, hello. I hope everything is okay 10 years from now. Um, either way, you can watch this anytime, whenever you want. Uh, that is the power of On Demand. Um, but if you do have questions, if you do want to get in touch with myself or Nishit, we'll give you some information about how to do that at the end. Um, Nishit, let's start with a, a quick uh, introduction to you. If people don't know who you are, what Sybil is, give the audience an idea of, of who you are and what you're building. Absolutely. So, um, hey everyone, whoever you're watching and uh, whoever it is, um, if you're from 10 years in the future, I hope I'm alive and I hope Sybil is also alive. <laughs> um, anyhow, so uh, I'm Nishit. Uh, brief background about me I'm originally from India. Uh, and came to the US for my master's from Stanford. Stanford was amazing. I spent years working on AI research, primarily around computer vision, natural language processing. You know what, what that's all about now. Um, and uh, yeah, followed that up by starting Sybil with some of my classmates. And lo and behold, two years into this journey, uh, we uh, we are really enjoying the ride. Uh, Sybil is now a product that's being used by 100 plus organizations uh, and sales teams. And we're just getting started. It's 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 a, it's a long journey. And what we're working on is it's truly something that we're passionate about and hopefully will change the landscape of B2B for a long time. Awesome. So let's let's dive into that. What you're what you're building. Um, the term conversational intelligence, conversational AI, gets thrown around a ton in your space. Let's yeah. start with a quick definition. How what is it, and, and how are teams typically leveraging that thing on a day to day basis? Yeah, absolutely. So um, just just to uh, just to provide some context on uh, what Sybil is, it's it's basically an AI platform that understands human behaviors on. Zoom calls. And so um, now with that context, getting into conversation intelligence, um, there, so there's there's one definition of what it literally should mean, which is, a, which is getting insights and intelligence out of any conversation that you're having. Um, and, and particularly in today's context, the most relevant of that is the remote conversations that you're having on Zoom, on phone, on whatever medium you're considering. And so uh, that's what conversation intelligence is, getting, getting all of those insights, getting the intelligence, using the analytics to improve yourself, no matter what your job role is, whether you're a recruiter, salesperson, whatever, whatever it is that you're doing as a founder like myself and things like that. Now, getting specific to what conversation intelligence means in the context of sales and marketing, it's essentially a set of tools that help you make sense of your conversations. Um, so the whole field started a couple of years ago when um, Zoom started call recording and a bunch of tools appeared that did call recording uh, and then layered on transcription on top of it to kind of create transcripts for every single call that was happening. Um, the, that's where AI starts coming in. Once you transcribe the call and after that you can analyze the call, hunt for keywords, hunt for topics that are that are being discussed. And from on a call by call basis, you can you can do that. And sales teams have leveraged that tech over the last three to four years that's been adopted widely across the board as teams have realized that, hey, we can go back into conversations, go into specific mentions of certain products, features, competitors, and so on and so on, and see, and kind of rewatch what really happened in those conversations. Uh, Overall, once you kind of scale up the insights from conversation intelligence across multiple calls and across multiple deals, you start seeing use cases emerge that are really, they're really starting to transform sales processes in B2B. Um, like, uh, for instance, coaching at scale, getting insights on who, which of the sales reps is excelling at what particular aspect of coaching and which ones are not, and basically using that to coach them better. Um, and also insights around 
overall market intelligence, what people are looking for, what the market is kind of captivated by at the moment, what are the top pressing concerns, um, what competitors are getting mentioned time and time again, and things like that. So that's that's kind of like a long-winded answer, but the, but the core being the conversation intelligence helps you get intelligence out of your conversations, make the most of your meetings. And, uh, and at scale, it helps kind of uh, a lot of use cases around coaching, deal management, and, and a lot. So I wanted to dive into a few of those use cases with you, because I think that mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis, what you describe is almost ubiquitous at this point. Like sales reps who have access to some type of conversational um, intelligence or even call recording tool understand that they can individually upskill themselves if they listen back to their calls, figure out maybe where they might have been able to frame a question differently or bring up a better answer to an objection. Um, Absolutely. That's on a, yeah, that's on a micro level, right? But we're talking macro now, finding an ability, like the ability to look at a bunch of conversations at scale and be able to pull out large scale trends. So one of the things that you mentioned as an example is helping fine tune your coaching or, or maybe even some of the sales processes that you have help you better understand the people that you have on your team and the buyers that they're dealing with on a day to day basis. Um, Absolutely. Let's dig into that example first and talk about how you might be able to leverage tools to to accomplish that. Yeah, absolutely, and um, and it's it's it's. Um, I was recently at this conference, um, and as I talked to a bunch of uh, buyers on the sales side, so VP of sales, CROs, and and those kinds of personas, this is really top of their mind, especially in these times. They really want their reps to be performing at the top of their efficiency, uh, to to ramp up quickly, and to really deliver uh, on their quotas. And so uh, this this is one of the top use cases of conversation intelligence. Uh, can you identify? So uh, so let me let me take a step back and go into like how tools are helping on this front. First of all, even if you just record your Zoom calls, that's a big, big bonus uh, as compared to not recording. Because mm -hmm. like right, right out of the blue, the manager now has access to call recordings. They can go back into some of them and see specific points, uh, especially if the rep is helpful and points out like, hey, this call did not go well, or I could not handle this objection. And you can go back and actually see how it was handled so that your coaching has more context. You're, you're coming from a point of view where you actually understand why is it that the rep did not answer it well. Um, mm -hmm. There could be like five different reasons why I can't, uh, I'm not able to handle a pricing objection. Maybe it's because I don't have enough context about what pricing looks like or what our company's discount structure is like. Or maybe um, I don't I don't really know how to communicate uh, the price of our product properly in a way that does not let the company down, but is also very welcoming to the prospect. Or it may be some something completely different. And you only get that context when you actually watch that or are you are or alternatively you're actually on that call. So, so that's like level one of it. Now let's get into level two of coaching, which is as a manager, practically you cannot rewatch every single call that your rep is taking. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what do you do? Uh, and I've talked to tons of managers and all of them have, have this nagging problem that, Hey, okay, tools like Gong and Koras help us record conversations, but like, sure, I can go back into one out of 10 calls or one out of 20 calls, but how, how do I kind of get insights that aggregate? And then comes this whole field of providing more analytics and statistics to help the manager in that respect. So for instance, IRFs talking too much, measuring their talk, uh, talk times and talk ratios, measuring how much filler words they're using, measuring how many questions they're asking or the number of next steps that they're setting at the end of each call. And all of those metrics help you quantify certain aspects that are critical to the sales process. Um, for instance, in a discovery call, I should not be talking much. Hmm. Or on uh, or on a demo call, I shouldn't be just giving a demo, but I should also be asking questions and handling objections preemptively. So there's a lo lots of things that uh, that managers can optimize on uh, through the sales process, and then when you can go into level three and get into far more granular and contextual coaching without having to review all of the calls, because now you can start leveraging not just uh, simple insights like talk ratios and number of filler words, but go even more deeper into specific insights uh, given by AI from just looking at the calls themselves. So imagine this, you have, um, um, as a manager, you have 10 reps that, that you are working with. Each of them are taking, let's say, 10 different demo calls every week. So you have 100 demo calls to look into. If you had an AI who was watching each of those 100 demo calls, understanding what's really happening, analyzing what is being said, and 
not said in context of what's happening, it can give you specific insights on, hey, this rep is weak at discussing this particular aspect. And the proof point for that is that whenever they handle this particular aspect, the prospect seems confused. And that is something that we are at the stage where uh, at least at Sybil, and I'm pretty sure many more companies coming forward, uh, we'll be un- uh, we are able to analyze that, capture that, and float that up to the manager that, hey, this rep has this weakness, and this is what they need coaching with. And you obviously have proof points in terms of the actual call recordings themselves. So that's kind of like where we are headed towards in terms of conversation intelligence getting far more granular and specific in terms of the coaching insights that is providing to the managers based, on, on, based off of an analysis of the calls. And this really helps save time, uh, up-level the coaching, uh, up-level the, the the kind of coaching that's provided to the reps and uh, you can quantify it in many ways, possible, many different ways of like what kind of an impact that has on the business. Yeah. I think the biggest thing that I took away from that is the, the proactivity that it offers managers because typically Absolutely. you look at, at the role as sort of a reactive, like, oh, over the past, whatever, 10 demos, we've noticed this has happened and you need upskilling in this particular area. Maybe it's it's handling a particular objection. And that yeah. only comes across the manager's desk when it becomes a problem, not when it starts to become a problem and is recognized by some AI that in the future, this will impact you by X percentage of you know, total meetings, which equals X percentage of pipeline revenue. Giving that, giving that information to managers early on means they can address it early on and save themselves that future pipeline revenue, which is which is huge. Yep, yep. Cool. Um, you brought up something else during what you were just talking about in terms of reps um, being able to almost like be upskilled proactively by, by this conversation intelligence. Um, mm-hmm. And something I wanted to just kind of touch on quickly in, in terms of benchmarking top performers versus lower performers. Mm-hmm. Um, how does this the the sort of realm of conversational intelligence recognize that a top performer is doing well and do they benchmark lower performers based on that rep or is it more how do they like start to pick out and recognize these patterns that you were talking about yeah that's a great question so um First, so in terms of benchmarking reps and trying to figure out like who's doing well and who's not and what their areas of strengths or weaknesses are, first of all, you need to identify what what metrics or what data points you want to look at. And so some of the metrics that are very common in, in this space are looking at talk ratios, looking at number of questions, number of next steps and things like that. Um, and you can look at all of that and you can kind of compare reps against each other. Even before this, you can look at activity metrics like number of calls set, number of calls in which prospects had their videos turned on, which may be an kind of indication of engagement and things like that. And you can compare that across reps as well. And then going deeper and uh, into the behavioral aspect of it, how uh, you can also compare reps on the basis of like, what's the, uh, what's the number of calls in which they get a prospect to an aha moment? Uh, if the whole point of a demo call is to get the prospect to an aha moment, at which point they're like, okay, I want this product. How many calls are you able to get there? Um, what percentage of calls rather are you able to get there? Um, even comparing reps based on the average excitement that they're able to generate among the prospects or the average engagement that they're able to generate and things like that. And you can compare based on a lot of these different metrics. And once once as a manager, you look at you can these metrics, it, it starts to kind of give you some sense of, okay, what's really happening across my team? Who's doing well? Who's not doing well? To your point, you can compare across reps and kind of see patterns. You can also compare across industry benchmarks. Mm-hmm. Though, I think a lot of the times, um, most of the sales tools in this in this regard overgeneralize. So, mm-hmm. industry benchmarks may not apply to your company uh, for for uh, for every type of call for every type of rep because like there's there's a lot of company specific and product specific context that you have to take in mind. Right. Like uh, there are lots of like obviously there's this whole movement around. Um, like Gong says that you should have uh, a, a, a good rep should have a talk time of 35 to 45% or something in that range mm-hmm. um, and not more than that. Uh, and that's that's great. That's a, that's a great general guideline. Uh, but specifically, uh, you kind of like uh, within the company, the manager or the sales leadership has to be very mindful of like how they interpret those metrics because it may be the case like some of our customers, like one of our customers is like all of their reps have more than 60% talk time. That does not necessarily mean that their sales team sucks. <laughs> it's just a different. It's just a different. Uh, it's just a different sales motion, and 
and they've they've tried vice versa and they know kind of what's what's working for them so all that is to say it's very contextual uh, when you compare it to industry standards they're good like as a as a kind of like just a number on the blackboard that okay this is basically what we're thinking what ideal looks like but it's still very contextual um comparing across reps though uh, it really helps because if you have reps selling the same product within the same team talking to similar kind of territories uh, then you can kind of compare across them and see like what what really is the strength and the weakness um in this regard, do you mind if I uh, share my screen for a second? Oh, yeah, go for it. Any any visual you have would be fantastic to to show the audience what how, what you're talking about. How can you sort of yeah. visualize this comparison? How to pull these metrics, stuff like that. Yeah. So, for instance, um, and so very selfishly, this is from Sybil. So this is just seeing uh, the the folks from our company who are taking calls with prospects, and we're just comparing them based on the amount of excitement they're able to generate um and in, in, in the prospect uh, when they're taking the calls and as you can see like our uh, our sales advisor benjamin is super super good at it at generating excitement his average excitement is 55 percent mine is 44 percent and so there's there's a huge gulf there i'm like 25 percent 20 percent less than him and so uh, it's it's just some it, it it does give me like some direction of coaching okay i should be able to generate more excitement because we are selling the same product to the same audience mm -hmm. similarly you can compare based and other metrics like how much you're able to engage the prospects or as i was saying uh, as i was talking about earlier uh comparing based on uh talk time um the average sentence length to make sure you're not being too too wordy and question rate next steps rate things like that so yeah in this way you can kind of compare across your team and kind of see who is doing well on what metric and each person may have their strengths or weaknesses, but it helps you get like an overall picture of what's really happening. And then you can dig deeper. So if my excitement level is low on calls, you can dig deeper into some specific calls on which you can see in civil, okay, where was it really, really low? Where did I completely bore the prospect? I hope I'm not <laughs> yeah. boring you, AJ, though. No, I'm, I'm very in tune to what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> I, I'm kidding, I'm falling asleep. No, I think, I think it's, it's interesting, right? Because we were looking at it from like a manager's, manager's perspective, macro view, but like you as an individual can go in and sort of figure out your own um, shortcomings and where you are succeeding. So you can benchmark yourself against not only your your team, but like you were saying, some industry benchmarks or even what your manager thinks of you. So it's interesting yep. that the individual contributor also has some opportunities to use conversational intelligence to learn and grow. Um, Absolutely. One thing that I wanted to maybe shift the conversation towards is you talk a lot about how these are um, individuals running like demos or presentations. When you run a presentation, I would say upwards of 75% of the time, there is some sort of like visual or piece of content or um, asset that you are sharing or delivering with the prospect. When yep. it comes to conversational intelligence, how is it helping reps understand the impact of that content in terms of what's resonating, what isn't resonating, how it might get changed, how they can work with marketing? Um, dig into that a little bit. Absolutely. And so, um, and you bring up an amazing point there, the way at, at Sybil, the way we like to think of like, what can we get from calls individually uh, is one aspect of what we're doing, which is the tree version of what we're doing. Like how much, how much of insight can we provide to the reps for every single call that they're taking? And then there's a forest view wherein we are looking at what's what's really happening what's resonating across the market what's really working be it be it for each rep or for each piece of content that you're sharing or for the sales process as a whole what's working and so this this sits up on the 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 second aspect uh, a, a lot more of like looking at the forest so let's say if i'm doing a demo in in just in the previous example if each rep is doing 10 demos every week uh, you have 100 calls each week in which you're doing the same demo and potentially hopefully in a, in a single consistent way, but even potentially in 10 different ways, each rep could have their own way of doing the demo. And then you can kind of see who is able to really deliver the message well and what are they doing differently? What message What message really resonates with prospects? If you see that they're like, there's a certain set of reps that are really following what, what the enablement and the marketing leaders have told them that, hey, this is how you deliver a demo yeah. and that's really working. Uh, well, that's great validation, but if it's not, and some other reps are really able to nail it, you're going to want to see what's really happening and tune your marketing messaging accordingly. And that's what uh, this word, uh, 
the previous generation of conversation intelligence tools have uh, not really tried to tackle as much and that we are trying to do with Sybil a lot, simply because where in the previous generation of tools, you can detect where certain keywords are being said or certain slides are being presented. You really cannot dig into how they were received. And that's where a lot of the reactions, the responses from the prospects are non-verbal. And it becomes really important to be able to understand their nods and smiles and leaning back and frowns and even getting distracted. Yeah, um, as you said, else, yeah. as you said, yeah, when I'm giving a demo, um, I just like, <laughs> okay, wait. <laughs> so, so, suddenly, uh, you're in 30 minute sales demo, and like suddenly, after five minutes, there are other things in your life, like the party that you were going to do, like that suddenly start becoming more important and you lose interest. And you need to be able to track that as a sales team and be able to say, okay, this is not working. Yeah. Where, um, where are we losing people? When, when yeah. I see this particular phrase or when I go to this particular slide in my presentation deck are people just like dropping like flies in terms of their- exactly exactly and the cool thing about that is so uh, in a simple perspective the cool thing about that is that in order to do that we only need to analyze zoom recordings and so uh, even if like uh, someone uses even if you use gong or chorus or some other tool to record your calls we can operate on top of it and give those insights to you so i can just quickly share what that double like looks, looks like so uh, this is, for instance, for our team, and this is again a dashboard within Sybil, uh, and we we call it the deck page because you can see how your deck and demos are performing on this page. And so each of these rows is a slide, and for each row, you can see the title of the slide, the average engagement that it generates among prospects, the number of times it's been used in the last month, and uh, when it was last used. And you can see a screenshot of the slide as well as whether well, typical questions that are asked when this slide is presented. Mm. And so you can see here that when I'm comparing the slides that I have presented recently, uh, you can see that this this one slide that I'm currently on has 100% engagement when I've presented it, which is fantastic. I love seeing that. But then there are slides like this one that has not even 50% engagement. It's mm. 49%. What that means is when I present the slide, half the time the prospects are disengaged, which is really, really bad. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> and <I can> imagine not. <laughs> and what that tip, and what that indicates, and you can dig deeper into like how I'm presenting it and what that means. But typically, what that indicates is that either the slide is irrelevant uh, to the overall discussion, or it is too complex, and so the prospects seem confused and distracted. And similarly, you can also see, for instance, this is a typical demo that I do, and so the average engagement of the demo is sixty-six percent which is decent, but it can be, it can definitely go higher. And ideally I would want it to be 80% plus. Um, and so you're gonna to start to see some patterns of what's really happening. I can also go into my team overall and like this is where it becomes really powerful for marketing because you can go into the, the slides presented by the entire team and see the data across all the sales reps who are presenting the slides. And this gives you like a more holistic picture of what visuals and slides and demo screens are working and which ones are not or yeah. over across all the sales team. Yeah. Um, As someone in marketing, I find that incredibly refreshing because there is sort of this mentality that sometimes like sales reps go rogue a little bit and they'll take mm -hmm. what marketing delivers and they either recreate or tweak it in some capacity. And that means that what results they're getting in terms of engagement aren't consistent, right? Because yeah. they think, oh, like whatever was put together doesn't resonate with our audience or it doesn't address this particular pain point like I want it to, so I'll change it. But having a dashboard like this where maybe you can go in and go, well, hey, look, everyone else has the same piece of content and their engagement is 86, whatever it might be, and yours is 72. Maybe it means that what marketing is doing is working and what we've put together does resonate. Flip hmm. side if you are using something that marketing does create and you start to, to understand that maybe it doesn't resonate all that well, you can create this feedback loop between sales and marketing and let them know like, hey, what, you know, this slide that you put together or this piece of content that you want us to use doesn't necessarily resonate the way that you think it might. And here are some tweaks that we think we can provide to make it more impactful. I think that's like a huge benefit to all of this in creating that, that feedback loop between the two teams to just create better more refined content that theoretically resonates better with your audience. Absolutely. What's uh, and a couple of points on what you mentioned, AJ, are really 
Super. Now, what this, um, I was talking to a CMO last week and when I showed her some of these visuals, her first reaction was, oh, this provides me data so that I don't have to argue with the sales team based on hunch or heuristics. I actually have data. So when they're telling me that a slide doesn't work, I actually have data to see, oh, it actually doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I need to really change that. And I need to provide them with something new. Or I can I could see in the data that, holy crap, it does work. It's just you who's not able to deliver it well. <laughs> and you need more training. And so that's and that's fascinating for us because that's that really plays into one of the things that we should strongly believe that sales conversations are not just for salespeople. They should they should be leveraged by the entire organization. Or uh, and it's not just for sales and sales processes. It's also for marketing. It's also for product development uh, and mm -hmm. product management and a lot of other functions in the organization as well to prioritize what's what's useful for customers. Uh, at the end of the day, it's your prospects, your customers that you're talking to on sales calls. And so um, this helps get into uh, some of the aspects of sales and marketing alignment, especially on the content and the messaging that's been delivered. Um, one more visual on, on this front, right? Um, so... Here, for instance, this is a sample analysis. Um, like So at Sybil, we keep doing these analysis for some of the companies. So for instance, if you give us your 100 com calls, we'll analyze them and kind of give you insights on what messaging is resonating. So if you focus on this uh, graph on the right-hand side, uh, here what, what you can see is that for this particular company that we were looking at, um, these were the three topics that we analyzed, integrations, onboarding, and security and compliance. And so whenever these topics are brought up, we plotted the engagement and the number of questions asked by the prospect divided up by the type of prospect. So the purple bars and indicate the users, user buyers, the orange bars indicate the decision makers, and the blue bars indicate the technical buyers. And so what we found once we plotted these, these charts for engagement and question rate was that hey, while the engagement and sentiment for technical buyers on security and compliance was super low, they asked a lot of questions. Mm. And what does that mean is that for the first time, you have data that surfaces that whenever your reps are presenting security and compliance, they get a ton of questions from technical buyers, which is expected. But the sentiment and engagement of the technical buyers is not that high, which is not expected. Mm -hmm. What that means is maybe you don't really have great answers to those questions. And so yeah. they're like, okay, these guys don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and so what this provides is, is insight to the marketing as well as to the sales team is that, okay, we need more content and better messaging around security and compliance, specifically regarding the question that technical buyers are asking on the calls. And these could be the CIOs or the CTOs. And so those are the kind of insights that once you begin to see them, you cannot just unsee them. And that's all of that is revealed by conversation intelligence that we haven't yet seen in the generations of tools that have come so far. Yeah, that, that's an awesome example. And and as we wrap the conversation up, I think that's one of the big takeaways that I grabbed from this is that you you just said it, once you see it, you can't unsee it. There's this <laughs> level of, of transparency that conversational intelligence kind of provides you between sales, marketing, revenue, product, all of these different departments within your organization that are responsible really for one thing. And that is to deliver a buyer experience that gets somebody attracted, engaged, and a customer, and then ultimately an evangelist. Like you want someone to come to your product, learn, understand its value, think that it applies to them, become a customer. And everyone's Absolutely. working together to do that same thing, right? Like you're all rowing the boat in the same direction. Um, so what, you, what you've what you done here with conversational intelligence is show that as you create a feedback loop between all of these departments, you start to refine and optimize how you deliver that experience to make sure that you, you are creating messaging that resonates with your buyers. You are creating content that resonates with them. You're asking the right questions. The right people are asking the right questions. It all allows you to move in, in, the, in the same direction, which I think is, is huge and really, um, if you're not doing that as an org, you're, you're kind of sunk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, as I said, right, uh, and um, as, as we're having this discussion, like this is something we truly believe at Sybil, that the power of conversation intelligence is not just in the conversation and not just for the sales teams who are taking those conversations. The power of conversation intelligence is that it could be a force for aligning the entire company towards what the prospects care about, where the market is heading, and yeah, convert more, not just convert more revenue, but have, uh, but basically get better and better uh, match between what, what your vision is and what you're building to what the market is really looking for. Um, so yeah, and 
And I think that's a really exciting vision to strive for and uh, understanding everything that's happening on calls is kind of like just, just the beginning of it. Awesome. Love it. Tip of the iceberg stuff. Um, well, Nishit, thanks for, for joining us. Um, I know I said at the beginning, we want to keep this short sub 30 minutes. So if people have questions, if they want to learn more about you, about Sybil, continue the conversation, how can they get in touch with you? Absolutely. So, um, I can, um, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, so feel free to reach me at LinkedIn. Uh, I'll just drop the link, uh, in the chat. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and I post quite a lot of content on LinkedIn around body language uh, because I'm passionate about the subject and what we're doing at Sybil is understanding human body language. So really, really about that and around sales best practices. Uh, as I, um, and, and so, yeah, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn, reach out to me as well. Um, if, you, if you're more of an email person, feel free to reach me at my first name at Sybil.ai. So it's Nishit, N-I-S-H-I-T, at Sybil, S-Y-B-I-L-L. AI. Um, so yeah, and uh, if you're more curious about Civil and want to learn how Civil could be useful for you, your organization, or how we compare with other tools, or how we layer on top of other tools, or whatever it is that you're that you're curious about, feel free to visit us at Civil uh, So yeah, that's it. And uh, yeah, it was, it was great chatting with you, AJ. I think this yeah. was a really interesting conversation. It was fun. Always happy to have you love learning about this stuff. Um, for the audience, if you have any questions, like Nishit said, feel free to email him. Feel free to email myself as well. Um, if you want to continue this conversation, learn more about what we're doing here at um, Demand Driving with our On Demand series. We're putting out these digestible pieces of content for all of you to learn and level up um, in, in little bits and pieces. So if you want to learn more about this, um, reach, reach out to Nishit. If you want to learn more about what we're doing here at Demand Drive, reach out to me. But thanks for joining us. Thanks again, Nishit, for, for being here with us. And we'll catch you next thanks time. Thanks for having me, Azir. Take care. Bye-bye.